When I had Cub Scouts, he used to come over and uh, he would earn his merit badges with Boy Scouts by helping out with the, with the children over here. And uh, uh, very well mannered, very nice young man, well raised, the whole bit. <laughs> and here we go again. I don't often take an overview of my career. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, I think somebody once told me, a, a wise person once told me, that if, if you're thinking about your career, you don't have one. <laughs> about being in Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers is that it really, it really drops off after the gig. I'm allowed to be famous for 95 minutes a day. My first band, you know. And it's, it's, there's, so many, there's so many cliches about bands that stay together a long time, you know, like it's like family. And, but that's what it is, you know. We've grown, we've grown up together. I was the new guy for a while. I mean, it's funny. People talk to me now, they go, the new guy. Ten years into it, the new guy. I think it's a, I think it's a, a great band. They're people that I've known a, a half of my life, or even a little longer, maybe. So I get to play music that I love with my friends. I think I was um, about 11 years old when I first became aware of rock music. I went home and traded my Whammo slingshot for a box of Elvis records that this kid got off his older sister. And that sort of ruined my life, I suppose. Started out all alone. Lots of kids at the time were getting instruments and trying to form little groups. And, and the one I joined was literally a neighborhood group of kids that lived near nearby. Well, I, we all knew each other in Florida. We all came from the same burg. That's all history, right? Everybody had Gainesville, the whole small little music town, pretty much university town. Stan and I put together a band to do some demos, and it turned out to be the Heartbreakers. It, so we all went in, and Ben called me. I called Ron Blair, who was to become our first bass player, and I'm, I'm sure that Ben called Michael, and uh, I think Tom came down to play harp or something, as I kind of remember. Everybody probably has a different re memory of that. And the group was so good, the demos they were making sounded fabulous. You know, we were all bringing in material and ideas, and, and just the more we worked on it, it, it became obvious that Tom's songs had an extra quality. I sort of started going, well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this could be something I wouldn't me, mind right? singing one, but uh, I. And I have a record deal. They made a record and it went in the charts. The sky was the limit. Into the great wide open. Everything else was disco, so anything besides being called a disco band was, was a compliment. But, I, you know, they call us a punk band when we went to England. They thought we were punks, and then they, they thought we were new wave, and then kept telling them we were just a rock and roll band, but they didn't, nobody seemed to understand that anymore, you know. Can you say I love rock and roll music? Can you say it makes me feel good inside? Really, my memory of those times is just always being on the run, intensely on the run, night yeah. and day. We were, we were having a great time, really. We were just playing gigs and... TV show with radio thing, you know, just night and day. There's something really great about the first few records that because they're so like lustful, they're just like they're just going for it. As soon as the musicians can make a living at it, there's gonna be 
a thousand other people that are going to want to make a living off of it, and probably rightfully so, and they all, it's going to get organized. Um, you know, it's just a tornado. And you know you better watch your step, or you won't get hurt yourself. Someone's going to tell you lies, cut you down to size. We had made this second album we were talking about, Fun Call, You're Gonna Get It. Now, this one actually sold a few, you know, and, and got a gold uh, album for us. And so we went back into the record company at the time and, and said, uh, you know, it might be better to give us more than a penny a record than, or whatever we're getting, you know. Like, now we, we've done, we've sold a few. Could we renegotiate the contract? So they gave us two cents a record. I'm taking control of my life. You know, you incur a lot of debt to a record company as you go along, and they, they mark it up against what you're going to someday make. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the logic that, well, if we owe you a million dollars and you're going to pay us just these few pennies of record, we could never pay you back for years, so we're therefore bankrupt. It was hell, and you had to hide the tapes. They'd try to confiscate everything we were doing. They even got an injunction where I couldn't perform live. We came out somewhat victorious, and then we made this album, Damn the Torpedoes, during all that period yeah. of being sued. And it was a big success, and you know, we went into third gear or whatever. <laughs> You had a, a lot of publicity about a struggle with your record company about the list prices on one of your albums. Uh, what would be one of the things that probably peeve you off most? The only times we butt heads is when they want to do something like take advantage of me. You know, like I felt like charging 9.98 was taking advantage of me. And if you notice, records are still at 8.98 for the most part. You know, which uh, makes me feel good about that because they didn't have to do it. Ron Blair left after Hard Promises. The pace of life was really fast. It wasn't at all what he was interested in. He, he left music completely. I was producing an album for Del Shannon at the time, mm -hmm. in uh, 81. And Del's bass player was this guy, Howie Epstein. And he came in to do a track, and I thought, Perfect. You know? <laughs> and then the next thing I heard, well, maybe, you know, they're looking for a bass player, maybe. So, make a long story short, I went and auditioned for the band. So we stole him from Dell and <laughs> put him in the band, and he's, he's been there since. Well, it was rock and roll music more, and uh, something totally different to us. And, uh, I guess thought it kind of it was a fad that would come and go, uh, that generation's music, and had no idea it would end up anything this big. Very happy for them, though. Yeah, I'm better for you and me. Honey, wait and see. With some times, we ride around. She plays the radio up loud. If I was sad, well. Do it as long as I could. What happened? The vocalist vocal mic is so loud. Oh. Turn this thing down. One. Ah. No, no, no. We want it down. So I, I think I like the studio a little too much, you know, because yeah, I, yeah. I could stay there endlessly and just make sounds, make noises. You know, I wear everyone out. And nobody wants to stay. They always want to go before I do. When I put myself in Tom's shoes, it, it's. It, it, I, I get tired. I don't think I really couldn't be. I couldn't be what he is. He's all the time, round the clock, creative, always. Tom, if he has four days off, he thinks he's he thinks he's lazy. And, but he gives you this impression that he it's all so easy and it's so gen, it's so gentle and it's and I know he works hard. We did this record with Stevie Nicks. I wrote her this song finally called. Uh, 
the inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we cut the song and, and sang it, and I I thought it was such a good song. I didn't want to give it to her, <laughs> you know. I said we should we should be able to work something out here because I I really like this song and it it's I, I think it belongs it in my album. <laughs> so maybe we can work something out. I'll give you something else. What am I supposed to do? Okay. I, I, I knew it. Creative writing, right? Did you ever take that? Uh, I tell you, I just barely got through school at all. English was about as deep as it got. Friends, friends. Um, you come knocking on You come knocking on my front door. They all on you, you do, you people. It really didn't sound like much of anything when we did it. When she sang it, became something else. So bless her heart, she had a big hit with it. We were not really pleased about that because it was it was put out at the time we were releasing our second single from the album and it just, you know, knocked us out of the way. Like we had a huge hit, but we were on a Stevie Nicks album, you know? Stop dragging my heart around. Is it all right? I'd really never been like a big hellraiser before. <laughs> I, I'd probably because I was always occupied. But we were at a funny point in our life where we didn't really have to get up and go to work each day for the first time. And we all handled it in different ways. But I, I just tended to get lost for some reason. I don't mind, I can face it. I don't mind, I can take it. I don't Everybody goes through dark times, and the band went through dark times. I went through very dark times. We were all pretty scripted. I mean, it all happened almost on schedule. You know what I mean? It was like the, the abusive periods, however you want to call them, if it was drinking or any kind of abuse, whatever it would be, it was all pretty scripted. It came right down the pike, right about when you'd expect it. We didn't break any new ground. Just overindulging and smacking walls out of frustration that, but that probably wouldn't have been there if I'd have just kept my mind and clear. If you don't watch it, you won't hang around very long. So we were lucky to, to get through that period in our lives without uh, short-circuiting, you know. And we're still here. We all realized that we needed, if we wanted to keep the group going, that we had to get ourselves together and, and mm -hmm. play some more. Unfortunately, Bob Dylan, who I think two or three members of the group had been playing on the album he was doing, and, and Ben had worked with him off and on for a while. Mm -hmm. And Bob said, well, how about a tour? Of It felt really good to me to do that. And I got it myself in a, I think it really helped me in a lot of ways. Put me in a whole other seat, you know, where I didn't have the responsibility of carrying the show. Everybody's got somebody to leave. Wilburys came later. Uh, I was the end of the tour with, with Bob Dylan. In, uh, in London, in Birmingham, we were there for a period of about a week. And there was George Harrison and, uh, and Jeff Lynne came to quite a few of those shows. And we got along so well, it was just one of those things where you, you meet somebody and you feel like, you know, they're just your old pals. Well, it's all I was hanging around with Jeff Lynn over the Christmas holidays, and we just 
I'd written a song and I played it to him and he said, that's good, what if you played an E minor there? And I said, okay, I'll try an E minor. And then it was even better. And so we, we went and the Heartbreakers weren't around really. So we went to Mike Campbell's house where he has a studio and, and we made a couple of tracks and the Heartbreakers weren't planning to work really at that time. It was at a time when we were supposed to be taking time off. So I said, let's just do, these went pretty fast. Let's just do some more and, and I'll call it the solo album. Oh, you're so bad. Best I ever had. How many years will you crawl through this castle? Roger gave me one of my first gigs on a tour he was doing, I think in 77. He was also the first person to ever record one of my songs. You were just a face in the crowd. You were just I never dreamed that I'd get to work with anybody. <laughs> you know, I never dreamed that anybody would give me the time of day, so I'm, I'm way ahead of <laughs> what I wanted. There ain't never been nothing quite like this. When Tom did the Wilburys project, I felt left out. You know, like, hey, you're doing a record, I'm not there. You know, I would like to have been involved in that more. But so probably that's how they felt. You know, when we did the solo record. After all these years of playing in that one band, what is the big deal if Tom went off and did a solo record? I thought it was great. Well, I don't think it was really that pleasant for any of us. I really don't. The, the beginning of that, how that, how that started, I think, was awkward for everybody. How it came out was great for everybody. As a result of Tom doing that record without the band, he got to do something that I'd been doing, that we'd all been doing all along, work with other people. How he was in his own world making the albums with Carlene Carter. Yeah. And Mike was with me making Full Moon Fever. Ben Mond had fallen in love, which took care of everything. <laughs> uh, and Stanley bitched a lot. Now it's much better time because we don't, none of us look at the Heartbreakers as our sole creative output. And I think that took an extreme amount of heat off and allowed us to, to really make better music than we had in years. About Why it. you want to know? You want to know the lyrics? We spent about two and a half hours one night trying to figure out on American Girl your lyrics in the second verse there. Well, what you do is you just don't worry about it and you kind of... <laughs> you, you, you <laughs> That's put the way a, we're doing it. You, you, you get a fork full of food and just sing and... Um, <laughs> it sounds the same. I really like that one. American Girl. It's one that we've done for years, too, but it's a very durable song. Mike Campbell wrote the music, and I, I wrote the tune and the words over a tape of the music that he had given me, and I put it on, I wrote it, and very short period of time. I do think that the ones that come easily are, are often the best. For the waiting, I had the 12 string guitar. I wanted something that, uh, you know, that had a, a little lick from the beginning. And that's all I had, see? I did that for a week. <laughs> and then finally, I'd hit the waiting. And then I'd go, well, now what? And I'd be like all week. <laughs> you eat dinner, you come back, sit down, pick up the guitar. People start banging on the wall. Don't play that anymore. Final stages of the song is sitting down and trying to tie it up lyrically where it all, you know, got across the thing. And when it did, you know, I got real excited. <laughs> Falling. 
I love that song. I always did, from the moment I wrote it. It just sounds so good, you know? Like, it's, it's more than uh, the words or the melody or anything. It just all seems to fit right, and it's the right timbre of voice for something. It just makes a beautiful sound. I think we played it and performed it live much better than we ever recorded it. You know? I think that was the one I actually smashed my hand a bit. I was so angry about the mix. I didn't want it to be an anthem to wave Confederate flags. I see kids come to the shows with these Confederate flags, and I think they think, oh, Tom's really going to dig this, you know? But I don't dig it at all, you know? It's not, it wasn't meant to be my trademark or logo. That's the most natural thing we do, is, is perform live. That's really what we're best at, I think. That math. Even to this day, if somebody, if, you, if I hear Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, I still think of this really great touring outfit. You know something, time stands still, it's funny. Two years could go by, and we come down to the rehearsal hall, it's like a month had gone by. The main thing I like about the band is just having, having guys to play with, you know, that we instinctively just hit a certain attitude when we play. I love that. Just throw me a song and, and you have to hold on for dear life and you have to hold on to each other for dear life and you have to look stand straight in the eye and you have to watch Tom's hands to see what's the next chord he's going to hit on the guitar and that's music that's music oh yeah glad to be employed <laughs> I'm honestly just glad to be able that I'm going to get to make another record and still play in a rock band at 40 is, is wonderful you know I always figured at some point they're going to say, okay, time's up, you have to go to work. First song I ever wrote was in C7. I mean, like, uh, um, baby, I'm leaving, leaving here today. You know, it's kind of like a traveling song. <laughs> baby, I'm leaving, leaving here today. I guess it was a blues. Right? You done me wrong, I took it too long to stay. And then the, the chorus is like, I'm gonna find a girl who's true. One who's not like you. One who really cares. One without no hair. Uh -huh. You know, like that. I was 13. Yeah.